us on our Muscogee Creek Nation Facebook page through the Department of Community and Human Services. This, this today we're wrapping up our final listening session for 2014. And we'll start this morning off with the song and a prayer. And if I can have Floyd Jones, Director of Community Research and Development, um, honor us that way. I hayat ked ale jejet meko sape monga o ya kadis I hayat ked ale jejet meko sape monga o ya kadis Meko sapa chiho dozet jela hos lez o yakadis Ay hayat ke lai lihi jijet Meko sapi monga o yakadis Ak Kasama se hodos et chenai hos leis o yakadis Ay hayat kenai leijet et meko sapi monga o yakadis The words of the song simply says, begin your day with prayer and be prayerful thought throughout your day. Great message. It's good that we can come together in fellowship with each other, as, not only as a nation, but as a people. As we come together this morning uh, to, to discuss the happenings of the nation and to listen to our citizens, uh, the things that they may be going through, the questions they might have. Father, we're just so thankful that uh, we have that opportunity to be able to come together in this fashion. Father, we just ask you to be with us throughout this day. Fathers, we ask um, you be with us. We ask you always to keep in mind our great nation and that you will always um, love and support us in a way that you've always done and provide us guidance as leaders within our nation and our elected officials and our leaders of the different departments. And we just ask special prayer upon all, all of our citizens. Uh, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his shedding of blood for each and every one of us. Be with us throughout this day, for it is in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Again, we still have some citizens coming in, and of course the rain has delayed us, and the OU, uh, TU game, I'm sure a lot of people are at home, but hopefully they're tuning in through um, the webcast and watching us um, in the comfort of their homes today. So we appreciate those that were able to come out and get out in the rain, and for all of you for being here today. The listening sessions, we held our first listening session in February of this year. The purpose of the listening sessions is for the Muscogee Creek Nation principal chief and cabinet, cabinet members to take time to listen to citizens and compare the needs of the citizens with the goals and aspirations of the administration in order to fulfill the mission of the nation to operate a self-determined visionary government designing, developing, managing and advance, an advanced service system for its citizens and communities while maintaining the traditions, cultures and respect of the Muscogee people. We must take this opportunity to hear stories, challenges, concerns, and vision of the Muscogee citizens. Feedback from citizens will be incorporated into the nation's current strategic plan, and attendees and amendments or additions will be added to account for the needs expressed by citizens. So we just want to, again, express how important it is for our, to hear what our citizens have to say in every aspect, good or bad. We know there's always opportunity for improvement. There's always opportunity to educate you on the services that we are providing you. And there's ways we always want to give back to our communities. Again, this is our fourth and final listening session for this year. We were able to travel to our Muscogee area, to our Southern Regional Office area down in Wetumpka, and we're wrapping up here um, at Omogi. And again, this is a new initiative 
um, by this administration to get back to the citizens. So we look forward to 2015 and coming to a community near you. So at this time, I would like for our Principal Chief, George Tiger, to welcome you all. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning to our citizens, our friends that are watching this on stream uh, on the internet. Uh, we're always uh, are proud to be able to provide uh, the opportunities for our citizens to come and, and share their concerns, uh, have questions about uh, any of the programs that we have. Majority of our uh, cabinet members are here uh, to field any questions. Uh, I must tell you that uh, these conferences, these uh, listening uh, meetings that we've had have been very, very fruitful. Uh, when we came in as administration, we did a straw poll to find out from our citizens as to what their concerns and their priorities are in terms of what they would like to see their government do. The number one thing that we found out coming in was health. And I don't have to remind you the advancements that we've done in the last two plus years in the areas of health and adding our resources and the ability to uh, expand our services in, in the uh, health arena. In addition, we've uh, done some things in housing as, uh, as an example to cut the cost of what a house uh, is built for in the past. It's, oh, it was always too high and to some degree we felt like that we uh, set our citizens up for failure by uh, giving or uh, building a house that they would have a hard time being able to m maintain to some degree. So those are types of things that we learn from our citizens and that's why we're here today. For us to hear what you have to say. You know, uh, one of the other things that we did coming in as, and as administration, we really didn't have anything to build on when we came in. We had to almost start from scratch. We didn't have a blueprint. We didn't have a roadmap, if you will of what our citizens were wanting. One of the first things we did was we had a strategic planning session where, where some of our citizens came, elected officials, employees, our cabinet. Many people came to share their ideas about the direction they would like to see their tribal government take. And out of that, a lot of the things that we came out with uh, the, in the strategic plan, within a four month period, we had to go back in and tweak it because we were able to accomplish majority of those things <clears throat> in the initial strategic plan. We're looking at doing the same thing here shortly to continue the progress that we see at Muscogee Creek Nation. Having said all that, I also was, want to share with you that none of this would happen without the ability for us as an executive branch having the ability to work with our legislature. That is so important. I believe that there, there's one message that was loud and clear in this last major election that this nation held was that they wanted their government to work together. And I believe we see that. And I believe that that continues on. So having said all that, I want to again thank our citizens. Because none of us, regardless if we're elected or those of us that are appointed to positions, would have that opportunity if it wasn't for our citizens. We place all of our emphasis as workers on the importance of providing the best we can for those people that we serve and our greatest resource, and that's our citizens. With that, I'm going to, uh, again, defer back to uh, Ms. Giles, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. For those of you that are watching on the web, webcast, uh, it is raining here in Oklahoma. Uh, it's much needed rain. Here lately, we've had a dry spell, and uh, uh, it's again, as uh, Mr. Jones in his prayer said, we have received a tremendous blessing here in Oklahoma with the rain that we have. So again, thank you very much for being a part of this. We look forward to hearing what our citizens have to say. And again, all of the uh, various departments and divisions are here that are represented, uh, represented and we look forward to, to continuing this effort. While it is the last one for this calendar year, we may uh, also uh, next year do it again, but we'll, we'll have to take a look at uh, you know, the concerns that our citizens have today, compile them, and, and uh, again, uh, have a plan in front of us to, to address those concerns and issues. With that, thank you very much. 
Madam Chief, and for the audience members, we do want to um, thank Representative Joyce Deer for coming out this morning, our National Council Rep. I believe I've seen also Mark Randolph. So again, it's important that we continue to work together because they too, as council representatives, have to listen to what your needs are so that we're all working for our citizens. So thank you guys for coming out this morning. Um, few announcements. So those of you, if you're watching online, or even you in the audience that doesn't want to necessarily ask a question out loud, when we get towards the latter half of our morning, um, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So there's two ways you can um, text your question in to 918-706-8118. Again, then 918-706-8118. Or you can go through our Muscogee Creek Nation Facebook page. It's facebook.com backslash MCNDCH, MCNDCH. So we'll make that announcement throughout the morning. So there's two ways you can um, text us or message us your questions that you may have. So while I'm here, I'll go ahead and give you my quick update. I don't think I formally introduced myself, but my name is Shara Giles. I serve as your Secretary of the Department of Community and Human Services. There are 12 programs underneath the Department of Community and Human Services. And I always like to say we do everything from cradle to grave services. We do anywhere from child welfare to adult protective services to our food distribution programs, through our WIC programs, and our southern regional and Muskogee regional offices. So we're very excited about what we're doing in the Department of Community and Human Services. Um, we're looking at new initiatives. So just recently, we're still in the middle of our budget hearings, but um, through some negotiations with our council, we're looking at starting two new initiatives in uh, fiscal year 2015 in regards to servicing our citizens with developmental disabilities and establishing a stronger youth services program. We have an opportunity that we are not completely reaching our youth at the age they need to be um, and re-looking re at getting our vision from our youth too and looking at um, reestablishing our tribal youth council so that our kids have an opportunity to participate in our government and have a say in what works best for them. Um, so we're excited about that and those opportunities that are becoming available. Our programs are ever increasing and the workload is ever increasing and if anybody's got to visit the complex here and look around we are always scrambling for space and always scrambling um, to be able to provide those services in an expedited manner. So we're excited, we we're, were able to open up some satellite offices over the last year. Um, so we now have an office in Sepulpa for um, some of our child welfare workers, as well as in Eufaula for our family violence prevention. And we're just about at capacity at our Southern Regional Office, so we're very excited about that. So we're having to look at maybe doing some remodels there in the future to add additional office space. So that our citizens in the Southern District have that opportunity to continue to get services directly in their neighborhood and not having to come all the way to Okmulgee. Um, again, we just recently opened our Muscogee Regional Offices. We just have two office spaces there for now. Um, and we've already had some of our programs go down there, and that way citizens, again, don't have to drive all the way to Okmulgee, but they can get services there. So really bringing our services to our people and being where they are is, the, is really important to us so that, and, and, and not take time away from our citizens. You know, if we had a call in Tulsa or down in Holdenville, that's half your day just driving. So it's important to be where the people are and not expect everybody to come here for centralized services. But here we're still um, going as quickly as we can to make things happen. And we're excited about all the things that we are doing. And we're very excited about some increases that hopefully our citizens will be able to see um, in October through our social services department. Um, it was advocated for and working with the council to make sure we continue to increase the services we need. We know the cost of propane goes up. We know the cost of utilities go up. And yet our programs don't, haven't been able to keep up with the needs. So we've seen a huge increase in um, thankfully, again, through um, good negotiations, positive negotiations, we were able to get those things in place for our citizens. So we'll be doing some rollouts in our marketing campaign through social services so our citizens can be fully aware of what they're eligible for, what's available, and, and the process for that. Everything has a process and a policy that goes along with those things. Um, definitely, we don't want to tell any citizen no when we don't have to, but everybody has to make sure we hit our benchmark so that we know we're utilizing tribal funds for every tribal citizen as much as possible because it's not fair when only certain people can get um, certain services. So we want to make sure we keep that door as open as possible for that every citizen has an opportunity to access those things. 
um, just want to increase um, with our federal funding. We're always very, very, our hands are tied a lot of times with federal funding. We're very um, regulated in those areas. So there's areas that we always try to look in, how do we fill those gaps? If the Fed's only going to allow us to do X, Y, and Z, then how does Muscogee Creek Nation add tribal dollars so that our citizens aren't being left out should those funds run out? So the nation's done great. We've done a lot of things in the last three years, so we're excited just that we can continue to move in that direction, in a positive direction, and, and for our citizens. So let us know, be thinking of your questions, and we'll be happy to answer those in the latter half of our morning. So, so that everyone can remain comfortable in their seats, we're just going to go around the table and have each secretary or representative um, from each cabinet level to give a brief update of what's going on in their areas, and then we'll open up the floor to you guys. So again, we appreciate you guys being here this morning. Um, and so we'll start off with Mr. Seneca Smith, Mudo. Yeah. Good morning. Can oh. you hear me? Well, maybe it's on. Go ahead. Give me a second. Good morning. Can you hear me? You got to turn it on. Your whistle. Oh, okay. Your whistle. Okay. <laughs> good morning. Uh, it's good to see everyone today. Um, there's been a lot of activity uh, in the uh, Department of Health for the uh, past two years. We're very excited about the direction uh, that uh, we're going. Uh, we, at the beginning of two years ago, we had 600 employees. Now we have over 1,100 employees. Uh, we have eight facilities uh, across our 11 county uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we have eight facilities. We have a facility in Coweta, facility in Sapapa, facility in Okima, facility in Wetumpka. Uh, a facility in Eufaula, and a, uh, the Omogi Clinic here in Omogi, uh, the newly acquired uh, medical center, and the uh, physical rehabilitation center. So we're very excited that we were able to uh, add those two additions to uh, to the health system. And in, reg and in Okima, we're uh, in the process, and we've already broke ground in, uh, on a new facility there. The current facility is a 32,000 square foot facility, and we will be expanding to a 120,000 square foot uh, hospital and clinic, which will be located right on the uh, south side of I-40. Um, very excited about that facility. Uh, the, inpatient, the outpatient alone in that facility is going to be 45,000 square foot, which will include a family uh, practice clinic, a specialty clinic, which will include um, cardiology, uh, podiatry, uh, ortho, and services uh, such as that. And in Eufaula, we uh, received a joint venture, been approved to receive our letter to move forward. So we're, we're ready to get that facility started. Uh, at the beginning of the year, which it was indicated that we were going to get a 60,000 square foot facility, uh, now with uh, specs changing in the Indian Health Service Clinic uh, model, uh, they've increased that to 70,000 square foot facility. So we're able to add uh, some more services in that 10,000 square foot uh, that they allowed us to have. So, and, and also we uh, will be visiting with uh, our council uh, this week to see if we uh, can move forward with another joint venture, a joint venture application uh, with the Indian Health Service. They only give you a couple of weeks to uh, get that going and we'll be uh, working fairly quickly to hopefully move forward with uh, that project and we will be seeking a joint venture for the Sepulpa facility. Uh, the Sepulpa facility is a 15,000 square foot facility uh, that is landlocked and is our second largest uh, per patient uh, in our facility so hopefully we'll be able to uh, be able to move forward with that joint venture and uh, expand that facility to about a 60 to 70,000 square foot facility there and uh, Sepulpa. We've added home health. We have a home health uh, within a tribe. We have a durable medical equipment. Uh, our MRI, will, uh, we're about two weeks behind on the MRI, but that has to do with the delivery of the equipment. What has happened, uh, there's five magnets that were ordered at the same time, and they're trying to get through customs at the same time. So um, ours was third on the list, so we're about two weeks behind of getting that MRI here, but the structure of the building is still moving forward. Uh, we have our shielding and everything that's going in our building, and so um, that magnet will be here shortly, so we'll be able to move forward with that service. Uh, this week, uh, Wednesday, we, broke, we had a ribbon cutting on our first dialysis, our mini dialysis center. 
uh, that we have in our system. Uh, as we looked at cost, um, every area across our 11 counties has a need for dialysis. And uh, as we looked at the cost, we thought it would be best to try to put a mini dialysis in each area. And what we're trying to accomplish is to what, increase our services and reduce the transportation distances that our patients have to drive to receive care. And just like Shara indicated, you know, we're interested in bringing the services to the people and make sure that our uh, people have those services so they don't have to take out of their day to travel to Tulsa, try to Oklahoma City for these services. So uh, our mini dialysis center it's, uh, has three chairs. Um, and it's more of a pilot. We'll see how that goes. And as soon as it starts going well, then we'll uh, be locating spaces. And definitely in our new facilities that we're uh, acquiring and uh, developing, a dialysis or inpatient dialysis will be in our facilities. Uh, and even at our, the PRC, uh, formerly uh, George Nye, uh, within the next month, we will be placing uh, inpatient dialysis there and in the uh, medical center that we have here. So very excited about that. Orthopedic surgeon, uh, we've hired an orthopedic surgeon. 85% of our ortho services will be provided within the Muskogee Creek Nation here in um, Otmogee at the medical center. Surgeries, we do everything. We will be doing everything in-house but backs. Uh, knee replacement, hip replacement, um, we will be all doing in-house. So we're very excited about um, bringing that service in. And on another note there, our surgeries, we'll be kicking our surgeries back up. We've had to uh, uh, decrease it a little bit so we can increase, uh, you know, change the boiler system and do some items in that surgery that allow us to uh, continue that service. Uh, our chiropractor, we brought in a chiropractor last year, uh, temporarily uh, two or three days a week, and now we've hired him in, a uh, Creek Citizen full-time, and his schedule's booked. and. Uh, and we've benefited greatly from that, and our patients and our providers really enjoy having that service. Um, we have, in regards to dental, what we have, each area, we have an agenda, and we have the priorities in each of our areas. And dental, we'll be really focusing on dental uh, this next year. Uh, the priorities in dental that we have is oral surgeon, pediatric dentist, and uh, we're gonna expand on our denture program for our citizens. Um, and the fourth is orthodontics, and we have that priority list, and we will be bringing in uh, or orthodontist, uh, which will be here in October. Uh, he'll be doing some general dentistry until we get the uh, supplies that he needs to, so that we can provide uh, braces and so on uh, for, our, for our Creek citizens and, and our patient. Uh, right now, he will be located in Okima because that's where we have the space but we'll, he'll be going to the other dental programs that we have within our jurisdiction. And so we're very excited uh, about having that service and uh, it's gonna be really good for us to have that. Uh, wound care in regards to, you know, diabetes is the number one uh, illness that as native people that we're uh, trying to uh, prevent and uh, cure. And we've expounded our wound care program. We brought in two top-notch podiatrists in our system. Um, I don't have the amputation uh, numbers on hand right now, but we have, we have drastically in decreased uh, those amputations that are going out of our system. So we are able um, to treat our patients before it gets uh, too bad in regards to having to go that route. And so we're very excited and we're just working on those numbers so that we can prevent, present those to everyone. Uh, I could talk all day. I'll stop right there, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And I, I told the speakers earlier, I guess your mics are on already, so you don't have to push a button. You can push the button to turn them off if you don't want it on. So <laughs> told you opposite. We don't want to hear you. No. Uh, so next we'll go have Secretary Wayne Johnson, Secretary of Department of Education and Training. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, certainly, it's a pleasure to be here. It's glad to see uh, everybody out and all of our citizens that are watching over live stream. Um, I think these meetings have been certainly very productive in having the opportunity to share a little bit about our programs. Uh, I think, as you'll recall, in 
uh, Chief Tiger's opening remarks. He mentions about our people being the greatest uh, resource that this tribe has. And certainly education is one of those that we have an opportunity to take advantage in strengthening and, and building uh, that resource. Uh, as an educator, for as long as I've been one, uh, and certainly now working for my tribe, we've always looked at the opportunity to be able to say that we are using education to build a workforce. We're using education to strengthen our people, and in so we're strengthening our tribe. And so having said that, when we look at uh, all of the programs that fall under my purview, uh, for example, Head Start, Johnson O'Malley, language program, the reintegration program, you follow dormitory, the higher education uh, office, the higher education scholarship foundation, the Tarot program, and employment and training. Uh, when I came here about two and a half years ago, we didn't have this many programs. So as we've looked and, and analyzed what the needs of this tribe has been, we've added two new programs. Uh, one of the highlights the, this year, this new fiscal year, that we're hoping to add an additional program uh, called Career Services. I think one of the things that one of the changes over time that we've made with education. In the past, we've always just handed our students a check and, and sent them off to school and say, good luck. You know, we've not necessarily provided the kinds of support services that our students need to be successful uh, in educational institutions. And certainly not all of the educational institutions make an attempt to address the needs of our students. So we as a tribe are taking the responsibility of providing additional support uh, activities and efforts to ensure that when we send our students off to school that they're going to have the best opportunity to be successful. Um, so we're hope hopeful that uh, as we move through this next fiscal year that uh, career services will be a program uh, that will be able to provide those services. Um, one of the, another thing that I'm terribly excited about uh, in the education and training area is that uh, by October 1, we hope to roll out a data management platform with all of the nine programs under the education and training department. You know, one of the things when we look at program improvement, program change, uh, how are we deciding what needs to be improved? How are we deciding what needs to be changed? And certainly with this data management platform, we're going to be able to analyze data to see what kinds of things are being successful, what kinds of things aren't, so that we can make better uh, our programs in providing uh, more effective and more efficient services to our students and to our people. So we're very uh, excited about that. Uh, as you know, this year we've, we're submitting a grant to create a pre-Head Start program. Uh, you know, as I think with most Head Starts, you know, three and four year olds are very successful programs. At the same time, uh, there continues to be a lack of preparation for our young ones to, to be prepared for school. And certainly the establishment of pre-Head Start programs will give our young ones an opportunity to, to strengthen the skills that they already have uh, in preparation for going to school. So we're, again, that, we're very excited about that opportunity. Uh, I think most of you know we're uh, this year, uh, we're going to hopefully, hopefully break ground on a new reintegration facility in Henrietta, uh, ex expanding our services there for our people who have been incarcerated and look to transition back into Muskogee and uh, public society. So uh, that's an, another exciting opportunity that I think you know we're going to be providing for our for our uh, citizens in the future. Um, Johnson O'Malley, uh, I'm honored to serve on the national board of the Johnson O'Malley programs. Uh, as you know, Johnson O'Malley count, and therefore their funding has been frozen since 1995. Uh, this year, the BIE is, and certainly some of our lobbyists uh, that work for this tribe have made an effort to uh, create an opportunity to establish a different count because we know that there are more native students out there than what the count has been for the last, you know, 
20 odd years. Uh, so we're very excited about the opportunity to uh, strengthen the funding uh, for Johnson O'Malley, hopefully with the intent of making uh, Johnson O'Malley a, a federal law rather than just legislation. Um, our literacy program, I'm still very excited about our literacy program. Uh, I know of no other program when we talk about all of our citizens uh, in this nation that have an opportunity to continue to read, uh, to strengthen uh, their literacy skills, which lead to better understanding. Uh, so we're very excited about that, especially for our young people. So I want to encourage uh, all of you here this morning and all of you out there by live stream to ensure that uh, you're, you're getting your password and getting your young ones uh, on the Mayan website and encouraging them uh, to read. Another exciting uh, venture that I think we're in, uh, partaking in is uh, our language program. You know, I think in the past, you know, we've always just sort of believed that within the education training building, in a small room with maybe seven or eight people, that we were going to preserve our language. Uh, obviously, we know that that's not been successful, that there needs to be change in how we do things. So one of the things that we're trying to do and working to do is to uh, certainly identify speakers, uh, but we're also needing to identify them uh, by community so that when we look around our 11 county jurisdiction, where, where are those speakers and how can they help us to preserve uh, our language? Because one of the things that we would like to do, while we're concerned about our language being taught within those communities, as you know, uh, there's also an initiative to teach our language in schools. So uh, these kinds of programs are not easy to establish. We're working on them as much as we can with the staff that we have available. So we hope to uh, keep giving you updates on, on how we're doing with that. Uh, I do encourage you that if you know a speaker, somebody, maybe one who also can write and read uh, our language, please let our language office know because we're continually uh, looking for those people. Uh, because eventually what we would like to do is to uh, certify them as teachers of our language so that if we may need a, a teacher in a school, we will certainly utilize their skills as well as utilize their skills uh, of teaching it within the communities. Um, we have a couple of other things. Uh, for example, as you know, while we provide higher education opportunities and employment and training opportunities, we're working on establishing an apprenticeship program. Uh, those, those people that we hope to uh, give the opportunity to become certified plumbers, electricians, uh, through this apprenticeship program. Uh, we're very close uh, and I think we've already identified some people that are uh, that we're working to put into this program. So because we are and one of our initiatives is to build that workforce, we're hoping that uh, our people will start to say to themselves, hey, I, you know, I think I can do that and notify uh, employment and training in our program and have, a, uh, have them be a part of uh, our programs to uh, cre create these apprenticeships. Wayne, I think they're calling for jobs already. No, I think so. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure what that is, and I apologize for that. I hope so. Uh, let's see. Have I talked more than Seneca yet? <laughs> <laughs> No. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, over the, over the last couple of years, you know, we've increased our, our funding, you know, for our programs. You know, we, we we're fortunate that we have a council uh, who uh, understands the educational needs of our people and have worked with us to uh, strengthen our budgets, to provide more opportunities for our students. Um, and so, we really think that as we move forward with education, we're, we're going to strengthen our programs, strengthen the services that we provide to our people, and in turn, uh, strengthen the more positive outlook for our future of our tribe and our, and our people. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Next, we'll have Richard Fisco, a light horse chief. Hello, good morning. I won't talk as long as the rest of them. <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm the light horse chief of police. Um, the two things that I, I want to talk about today as far as the positive side of our, our department is uh, the five officers that we have placed in River Spirit Casino. Uh, they seem to be doing a good job. Got a lot of compliments on that. And the uh, four new hires that are starting tomorrow. I have three Creek citizens that are starting tomorrow and one gentleman that is a certified officer from the Chickasaw uh, Nation. Uh, they'll be starting tomorrow, so we'll have some new faces out there. Uh, two of them are certified and two are non-certified. And uh, that means that they'll have to go to the academy, but you know that's something that I wanted to put uh, some Creek citizens out there. I had a couple that were in my reserve uh, that really showed promise, so I placed them into a full-time position and they'll probably be, you'll probably see them for just a few months out there on patrol and they'll be gone for 16 weeks to the academy, but uh, I think they're gonna make us some good officers that have a pretty good insight in Indian country, so uh, that's the positive side of my, my department. You know, law enforcement's always, you know, it's not the prettiest sight and everything, because when I get busy, it's normally not good, so. But the positive thing is, is we're still out there. We're hopefully getting into the communities. Uh, we've been wanting to do more community policing out there, get out and just see the community and let the community know that we're still there. Um, as you know, we have gotten busy. I'm sure everyone's seen the things in the newspaper, but you know, it's, it's, we're out there doing what we can for the nation and everyone else within the nation, so. Um, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. If anyone has any questions, please just ask. Thank you. Next, we'll have Jennifer from the Tax Commission. Um, good morning. I'm here. Um, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm actually here in representation of the Tax Commissioner, Jerry McPeak. Um, our office main function is the registration of motor vehicles, the collection of sales tax, alcohol, and tobacco tax. Um, I'm going to keep mine extremely brief because I wasn't aware that we needed to give a speech this morning. So if you have any questions in regards to any of those three, I'd be more than happy to answer those for you. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Um, we'll have Chief wants to say a few words. Just as an addendum to uh, Jennifer's office with the uh, tax commissioner's office, uh, last week <clears throat> Governor Fallon and I uh, signed off on, an, on a, uh, I guess, addendum, if you will, of the original compact that we signed a couple of years ago. Uh, that allows for our smoke shops the ability to uh, make more revenue, uh, allows for the, for the nation to also make uh, more revenue through the taxes. Uh, it is new. <clears throat> there are going to be uh, some other things that uh, involve with the compact that we're going to have to refine just just a little bit in terms of rebates. Um, it's uh, it's ironic that uh, when we came in as an office that uh, the uh, tribe was paying what they called a uh, non-compacted uh, tax. It was the highest tax that, that could be uh, assessed on a tribe. From that, now we probably have the best compact of all our tribes here in Oklahoma. Allows for almost $200,000 uh, uh, a month additional revenues coming to the tribe uh, over a certain period of time that uh, equals even over millions of dollars. And that's something that we uh, saw as something that needed to be done. So uh, we are uh, working out some of the details on the final part of uh, the rebate side so that our rebates can come at a more timely fashion so it, it doesn't interfere with uh, the flow, if you will, of the operation of the smoke shops that we have. But I wanted to uh, uh, announce that. Uh, we're very uh, pleased that we had what we call an open-end negotiations on the original compact that we signed uh, two years ago. Uh, and because of the relationships that we've established through our lobbyists, in the, in the state capital, 
uh, there's a lot more avenues that we're able to use uh, in terms of negotiations and some other things that maybe other tribes aren't able to do. So wanted to make that an announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, we'll continue to go around the table with our Chief of Staff, Dr. Bo Colbert. Okay, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, I'm Bo Colbert, the Chief of Staff. I really don't have any, what you might call, programmatic responsibilities or any particular programs under me. Uh, however, uh, I do like to work with each of the programs, and we have introduced models uh, within the administration here that are um, designed to increase not only efficiency but effectiveness. And uh, so those are slowly coming together, but they are coming together. I, I get asked this question a lot, what do you do? So I think this is a good forum for me to answer that. Um, as I came into my role, I sort of uh, looked at, you know, the nature of tribal government, um, the political uh, policy and the practical, or you might call problem sol solving aspects of sovereignty, and uh, kind of noticed, and I talked with Chief Tiger uh, several years before he came in, because we've always been longtime friends, and he had asked me to come to work with him. So we would talk about these things, and without even being here, I, I could notice that we weren't practicing uh, sovereignty to its, to its full extent. So he asked me a lot of questions about that, and uh, my role is to assist and explain how I view we can be more problem solving with uh, extending and practicing our, so our sovereignty. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I do a lot of um, screening for Chief Tiger. Uh, his time is, is, is really important that he spend it in, in the best way that he can. So his staff and I and my staff, we try to do what we can to uh, elim eliminate some things that we don't think should take up his time. And uh, so my role is, is similar to what you might call uh, uh, a, a daily um, person who sort of keeps things together while a chief is out doing his business as the principal chief of the nation. And um, so I work with all the different departments a lot. There's some particular issues that I might be able to help them with or to um, contact outside agencies that we can come together and talk about how they might be able to meet some of our needs. So my role is kind of broad. It's, it's really understanding the nature of sovereignty, the nature of cyber, uh, tribal government, uh, and those kinds of things. And I think that's important because if you don't have uh, a framework that you uh, use, uh, then you sort of uh, end up pulling things out of the air. And, uh, and we've, we've done a good job, I think, with Chief's uh, leadership of strategic planning, thinking, and aligning our programs so that we best meet the needs of uh, our citizenry. Uh, and I like uh, Ms. Giles' um, concept of decentralization, where she's putting offices out in the communities where it minimizes people's time and distance to, to getting services, and, 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 and the outcome is uh, uh, lessening their frustration. And, you know, and we've all been in those, those uh, kind of shoes where we, as citizens, we run into those kind of problems. So um, it's an ongoing kind of thing that uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying what I do here. And I, I admire um, uh, many of the uh, community members who have served in tribal government for a long time. So, uh, you know, with that, uh, thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Colbert. Um, I'm going to have Sandra Peters come down to the center mic. I guess we played musical chairs and she was out. But no, she is representing Jerry Wilson, our tribal administration office, so she can give us a brief update um, what's going on, what exciting things are happening through the tribal administration. We're going to take this out of here. Good morning. How are you? Uh, I'm Sandra Peters, tribal administrative assistant, and it's good to be here this morning. 
Uh, Jerry Wilson's office handles a lot of information. He set up uh, primarily strategic planning for the tribe, which sets up long range uh, uh, economic development for the tribe and, and, and the scope of it goes further than that. Uh, we did a mandated a history course, of course, which you uh, had uh, asked for us to do. Many of the things that Jerry does are things that the tribe, the people have asked him to do. And so therefore it's his responsibility to make sure that those things done. He sets the agenda for the cabinet meetings and uh, he expects those things to be done. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't he, Chief? <laughs> um, I'm uh, glad to be here today, and I hope that if there's any questions that you have concerning tribal administration that you'll let me know. I don't want to take a lot of your time. We've done a lot of things. We've This year we keep busy all the time. Um, we did the mandated uh, history course and doing the video for it now for your own uh, uh, information. Uh, we also set up uh, the uh, foundation program and now it's running very well. Uh, there are many economic ventures that come through his and his office and then he uh, of course moves them into the other areas which they should go. Uh, thank you very much and if there are any questions uh, later on please uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you Sandra. Next we'll have Ms. LaDonna Northcross representing our Department of Housing. Um, I'm here for uh, the housing department. Mr. Fox couldn't be here this morning, so he asked me to set in for him. I also have uh, Albert Poole that is our development manager, Natasha Natsaway is our admissions and housing manager, and Mr. Jerry Mays is our construction service management. Uh, a few programs that we're working on in housing, the 184 pilot program that will address the waiting list. We're excited about that program. Also, the SIP plant, we're putting out the panels, hopefully, for marketing. Uh, Mr. Poole and some of his staff will be attending Vegas to an exhibit to get that out there for Muskogee Creek Nation, the housing department. Also, you had some question in the last listening meeting concerning elderly housing. I know that uh, Mr. Fox is working on that, meeting with his staff. Also, uh, in construction services, we have nine houses ready to go in about two weeks. So Mr. Poole can answer any questions on that. And that is it. Thank you, Ms. Northcross. Thank you. I know it's intimidating sometimes to our um, assistants that work in our offices, so I want to thank them because, yeah, they didn't know they had to make speeches this morning. So, But we appreciate their secretaries that they represent, and their cabinet members that they represent because we know they're working hard and it was important to make sure they had a representative here, so we're glad they're here. Um, next is our Secretary of Nation and former Chief Bill Fife. Thank you, Shara. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see everyone out today. Uh, it's kind of a dreary day to be traveling around, but we appreciate the rain. It's good for our uh, environment. Um, Secretary of Nation is, is under the Department of Commerce, and we have just moved to a new location. Some of you probably don't know that, but uh, we're located in the old uh, agency, BIA agency building used to be the originally was a tribal dental clinic over by the administration office between the administration office and the uh, finance office so if anyone wants to find find the department of commerce and where we're at that's that's where we're at we're at 1002 bear lane the physical address um, our primary goal in uh, our existence is to strengthen the tribal economy by creating commerce in and outside of the nation. And in doing that, we are, uh, we are trying to create a foundation for building a tribal, our tribal economy, not building it, actually building it, but more or less strengthening it. We, knew, we see that we have a lot of people out in, in the communities that are interested in business. And uh, those are the things that we're working on right now. From the time we uh, started this office about uh, two years ago, we began uh, creating a 
community development financial institution and a small business development center. The small business development center, which is uh, directed by Mr. John Blue over here, uh, I want to introduce him. Uh, he's a good man that uh, knows business inside and out, and he can help with uh, doing business plans, doing business projections, finding uh, finance, financial assistance. He does just about everything there is to do with uh, creating a successful business. And uh, he works with many people every week. We have people coming in every week uh, wanting assistance with business development, either to in, improve their own, their existing business or starting a new business. We also have a Muskogee Loan Fund, which uh, is under the CDFI program, and that is directed by Ms. Lahoma Simmons. She's a Creek citizen, uh, has about 10 or 15 years experience working with the Cherokee Nation in their uh, CDFI program. And uh, she's, uh, she has, she and John together, working together, have made about 12 loans this year, small business loans primarily. Um, these are, she does the uh, credit checks, uh, does financial uh, investigation, background investigations, and so forth and so on. She is a, she and, and uh, another individual in, in our department are uh, certified credit counselors. We just had them, uh, sent them off to school this year, and uh, they became certified as credit counselors. So we have that, uh, that expertise in our office also. We, uh, the uh, Secretary of the Nation's primary, primary responsibility is to administer Title III and 3A of our Code of Laws, which uh, involve the, uh, uh, the uh, certification, the, uh, the, the, uh, incorporations, Corporations, uh, LLCs, nonprofit uh, businesses, and uh, the uh, Partnership Act. These these are things that uh, we administer within our office. We also administer Title 33, which is the Uniform Commercial Code, and that involves uh, uh, whenever financial. Uh, agreements or need to be uh, uh, certified within, a, within that office. Uh, we, we do those type of things. Um, we also are involved in uh, creating a business uh, of uh, compressed natural gas. We've looked at uh, different things that uh, could save the tribe money and also maybe make the tribe money in the future. And we feel like uh, compressed natural gas is, an, is a business that uh, could save, is, is going to be a coming thing in the communities throughout the entire state. There are about 88 uh, compressed natural gas stations in, in the state now, and we would like to uh, increase that number by getting into that business. We've also had some, uh, some uh, dealings with uh, communities, small towns, in uh, wanting to uh, partner with the tribe and uh, do some of this uh, compressed natural gas business, and, and we're looking strongly at that. We feel like uh, that is something that we could do that uh, would create jobs would make uh, money for the tribe and save money. We have about 500 uh, vehicles in our fleet uh, fleet uh, program, and uh, if we can uh, convert all of those over to compressed natural gas, rather than paying three dollars and fifty cents a gallon for gasoline, we can pay a dollar seventy-nine or so, 
or less than two dollars anyway and save a lot of money that way i i think we have uh, uh, a good uh, opportunity here it's an opportunity that can create other opportunities not only can we go into the stations we can go into converting vehicles converting our own vehicles and uh, putting people to work in that area in a shop that, that does that, and also the maintenance and operations of the, uh, the fleet vehicles. So those are, are some of the things that we're doing. We're, we're looking at into the field of energy. We've been working with the uh, Department of Interior Affairs in, uh, in their environmental group and the, uh, the uh, legal department in creating a, uh, uh, some legislation that uh, deals with the uh, creating a tribal utility authority. And uh, the way we're, we're uh, working on this, we want this utility authority to be able to allow us, the tribe, to get into any type of utility and uh, begin management of those services for the tribe. We feel like that's an area that, uh, you know, we're paying a lot of money in electricity here at the complex, at our, uh, at our uh, casinos, and throughout the, the tribal operations. And if we had uh, one department that could monitor these and manage these, uh, these utility usage, then we can save a lot of money. Uh, even by possibly buying uh, wholesale electricity or wholesale gas, gasoline, things like that. And uh, we would be able to analyze what we're using, know what we're doing, know how to do this business. And uh, I, I think there's great opportunities there for the tribe. And it also, as uh, Chief Staff said a few minutes ago, it would allow us to uh, exercise our sovereignty. These are things we can do just about anything that we want to do, but we've got to be able to know what we're doing, know how to manage, uh, and move forward with those things. And uh, it doesn't matter whether the BIA says we can't do something. We don't, uh, we're a sovereign nation. We're a self-governing nation, and I believe that uh, if we decide to do something, there's a way to get it done. And working with the National Council and the administration, I think that uh, a lot of these things are gonna be coming about here in the, in the near future. So these are, these are things that we do and uh, we're looking at. We've uh, also applied for some uh, grant funds we just recently were notified that uh, we received $150,000 from the uh, Department of Treasury for a uh, CDFI uh, technical assistance grant to assist us with uh, uh, getting our program in shape for certification. And uh, we, we, this past month in uh, July, we submitted an application for, for that certification with the CDFI, and we've had some contact back with them, uh, telling us, asking questions about some of the, uh, the things that we have uh, in, in put into our uh, application. And uh, we're dealing with that, with those people right now. Hopefully we'll get uh, approved for that and it will open up greater opportunities for the tribe to uh, do many things and uh, get in, you know, get more uh, grants and monies to uh, re-lend. It will help us with programs that uh, uh, in financial literacy, education, uh, many things that uh, we, we don't have available to us right now. So. I think that uh, this is going to be a great uh, thing for our future, and I, I, I really feel confident about getting, uh, getting this uh, certification for our CDFI program approved. Um, we've also uh, applied for an a and grant, and that was for a community development uh, 
program that uh, will al allow the tribe to work together in coordination with our uh, Department of Commerce and our uh, Community Research and Development Program, work with the communities in uh, doing, uh, I guess, assessments of uh, different things that will allow uh, economic development and, and community development in, in the communities and wind up uh, providing guidance by uh, developing some strategic community development plans. So I look forward to getting that grant. If we, if we get funded, we will have a great opportunity there. We also uh, applied for the uh, HUD grant, the Indian Community Development Block Grant, which is uh, $800,000, and that, uh, if we get funded there, then that money will be going to uh, business development, and uh, a lot of it will be made and uh, we'll be able to use for loans for uh, business and youth business loans. So uh, uh, another grant we've applied for is a uh, uh, Rural Business Opportunity Grant. We received this grant this past, past year and uh, did some training with it and uh, we reapplied. So if we get this uh, Rural Business Opportunity Grant this year, we're, we intend to create a business incubator. So it will help our, our uh, entrepreneurs with their business in uh, certain communities. So. Hopefully we can have an incubator in, in many communities and uh, also uh, do that. And these are just some of the things that we're doing. Uh, we have many activities going on over in our building. We have a new uh, conference room. We co-opt co with the uh, Interior Affairs Department and have a smart board in, in our conference room. The conference room will facilitate about 12 to 15 individuals and it's open to uh, uh, re be reserved by any department uh, to use and uh, if it's not already booked well we would certainly be uh, uh, in, re represent uh, anybody in uh, using that so these are things that uh, I just wanted to mention in, uh, in my discussion here thank you Next, we'll have Mr. Buddy York, Gaming Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Buddy York. I'm the Gaming Commissioner for the Muscogee Creek Nation. The Gaming Commission is an independent agency that was established by uh, Title 21 under tribal law. We're required, the tribe is required to have a tribal gaming regulatory authority if they're going to have casinos or gaming in their tribe. Uh, our major responsibility is to protect the tribe's assets. We don't actually run the casinos or anything, we just regulate them. Uh, and uh, as I said, our main concern is just to protect the tribe's assets. And uh, we have uh, five departments that we utilize to do this. Uh, the first department is our surveillance department. They're the people that man the, that are looking at the cameras 24 hours a day, seven days a week to make sure that everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing in the casinos. Uh, we have our larger casinos, uh, we have people there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. Uh, in some of the smaller casinos, uh, we only have a few people there because we're not actually required to man those, but we do try to keep some people there part of the time but every casino can be watched from Tulsa. So if uh, just because someone is not sitting in a surveillance office doesn't mean that uh, people aren't watching the floor because the, uh, the smaller casinos can be watched from Tulsa where we have our main office. We uh, regulate nine casinos and two travel plazas within the Creek Nation. We have 140 employees. Uh, most of those are in our surveillance department. We also have a uh, IT department that is required. We uh, make sure that all of the systems within the casinos are secure. 
Uh, it's our responsibility to see to it that anytime anybody is in one of those systems, a vendor or anyone from the outside, that we know what they're doing when they're in that system. That's the, that goes all the way from remoting into a back of the house system or someone opening up one of the gaming machines and working on it. We have to have someone there and we have to know what they're doing. Uh, we also have a compliance department. These are the people that actually walk the uh, casino floors. Uh, they will uh, watch people when they're pulling money out of the machines. They uh, watch people when they're counting money. They watch the kiosks. They're the ones that actually do the reporting on incidences that ha may happen on the floor. Uh, we also have techs that maintain all of these cameras. There's, uh, well, I don't have the figure with me on all of the cameras, but in Tulsa alone, there's over 1,600 cameras on the floor. So we have to have a crew that maintains these cameras, replaces them, moves them around. Seems like the casinos are always moving machines or, or something. And any time they move a machine, a card table, whatever it is, then cameras have to be moved because we have to have certain shots that are required. We also have an auditing department that audits the casino's financial reports. Anytime there is a clerk that is a certain percentage, say if they're over 5% off, they're short, long, whatever, then we have an auditor that has to go in and audit that and find out what happened so that uh, whoever is responsible for the tribe losing money uh, can be held responsible for it. We also have a licensing department, and under that licensing department, we license every employee that the tribe has. There's several different kinds of licenses, but most of them are key, are primary management. And those licenses, they have, we have to do a full background check, FBI, OSBI. If they're from out of state or have ever worked or lived out of state, we have to get police reports from where they lived or worked. Uh, we have to do a thorough background check on all gaming vendors, who owns the companies. Uh, we also have to license any company that does business with the tr casinos. And we're talking about over 5,000 of them. Uh, in the past, this really hasn't been done much, just from the lack of people and everything. Uh, but according to tribal law, we're supposed to license these people, so we're in the process of doing that now. Uh, so we license everyone, whether they do business with us one time or ten times a year, they still have to have a different kind of license depending upon how much business you do with the tribe, but they all do have to be licensed. Uh, and that's, that's just a quick overview of what we do there. Uh, at the uh, Office of Public Gaming, and uh, I'll be glad to take any questions when we get to that section. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Secretary of Interior, Jeff Fife. Thank you, Shara. Good morning, audience. Good morning, uh, tribal citizens tuned in through the webcast. My name is Jeff Fife, uh, your Secretary of Interior Affairs to uh, condense the, the mission uh, statement of the Interior Affairs, um, our purpose is to strengthen self-governance and protect tribal sovereignty. And I think in, in the 17 programs that are under the, the direction of Interior Affairs, each program touches on uh, our sovereignty and our ability to be self-governing. Um, I realize we're, we're crunched for time somewhat. We're at about the 1120 mark of, of our allotted time. I, I will say this. Um, under Interior, we have uh, federal roads. We've constructed more roads in the last two years than, than we have for quite, quite some time. Uh, transit. Our transportation numbers are, are increasing. They continue to increase. Um, Mr. Charlie Lesarge is the manager of, of both of those entities. Um, we work closely with the chief of staff. 
um, agribusiness. Our agribusiness is, is on solid footing. We, our beef production is near, uh, currently it's just over 400 head of livestock. By next spring, we anticipate having 500 head. Uh, and that's, that's through good management. Um, environmental services. We've expanded a, a lot of what we do in environmental services. We're now reaching into uh, some waste management services, solid waste management. Um, 4-H, it's youth focused. Um, this past year, we, we hosted the first uh, Muscogee Creek Nation 4-H livestock show. Uh, over 200 young people attended. <coughs> Um, tribal driveways, those, those folks don't get enough credit. Um, the, this past winter, there were three occasions which the tribe was closed for business, but those men uh, carried on. They opened grave sites for our, our families that were in need, that otherwise uh, may have been forced to deal with an, an alternative method of keeping up with the uh, burial service. Uh, cultural preservation, uh, a large program. Uh, within that is the cemetery services crew. Again, I think the, the work that is performed there is, is uh, essential to our continued existence. Realty trust services uh, deals with our land. Uh, Contrary to uh, some, some belief, we, we do not manage the IIM accounts yet. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier in, by the panel that uh, we can do some things uh, that have historically been performed by other entities. Uh, we are uh, looking at transferring some of those responsibilities. With, th with that being said, there are um, a number of federal inherent uh, authorities that, that will remain intact, but those uh, components of self-governance that are available to this nation, we, we aggressively seek those. Um, tribal construction services, again, I'll talk about inter, interdepartmental uh, relationships. Uh, tribal construction services, led by Mr. James Allred, um, completed the remodel of um, the Department of Commerce facility. We did that with a, a very minimal budget. We worked with the Housing Authority to complete that. We worked with our GSA services to complete that. Another project, the uh, WIC building, under Ms. Giles' uh, uh, leadership. Um, <coughs> We, we save a couple of hundred thousand dollars by utilizing our own uh, services internally, SIPS panels. That building is constructed out of SIPS panels. Um, tribal services uh, perform the engineering service. Tribal construction service, I'm sorry, perform the engineering services, provided the oversight of, of the construction of that project. Um, the alternative was to bring in a modular building, which would have cost us about $200,000 more. Uh, and we would have had to replace that uh, modular facility probably within the next 10 years. Um, now we have a permanent structure. I think uh, it, it's a bright spot of what we can do internally by working together. Um, Risk management, they handle the property casualty insurance uh, of the nation. Uh, workers' comp claims of the nation. Um, also, in addition to, to that, uh, is a subcomponent, uh, and it's Arbor Care Services. Uh, that crew, again, they, they are often overlooked, but they uh, perform uh, a great service to, to many elders, to the communities, to um, churches, ceremonial grounds. We're available to, to, to uh, serve when called upon. Um, 
GIS. Again, that uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned the education department is working on a platform to create a, a baseline data to serve his department. GIS is working on a similar one that, that will be inclusive of all programs of interior affairs uh, to, to serve as a central data point uh, where, where we can receive real-time real uh, information on statuses of, of lands. Um, while I'm talking about lands, and we have an audience here uh, in person today and hopefully a large audience on the web, uh, our Realty Trust Services has, has began performing an outreach to all the landowners. Uh, maybe a little known statistic, you, uh, us, that, that still have the allotments in our, our uh, possession, um, we, we collectively hold about 130,000 acres of restricted Indian land. Uh, that land base is very important. Our uh, tribal newspaper did a, a cover, not, not a cover story, but did a good article on uh, uh, the 47 Act, which is a federal act that affects our restricted land and deals with blood quantum, effectively takes our lands away uh, once the air uh, reaches less than half degree Indian blood. Our land is, is uh, as vital as many other things that are discussed today by the panel. Um, we have to preserve it. We've recognized that. With that being said, there will be more outreach sessions conducted by the Realty Trust Office. Um, I, I would close out by, by pointing out two new initiatives. Um, the, the legislative body uh, heard the initiatives, ultimately approved the initiatives. Uh, one would be the oil and gas department of the Muscogee Nation. We've not had one before. We've been told you can't manage your own. Uh, we now have an oil and gas department. It's, it's uh, about four months into its, its new era. Uh, little history with that. Uh, in 1906, the director of uh, Indian Affairs for the Bureau of uh, Indian, uh, in, for the Department <coughs> of Interior, excuse me, uh, established in Muskogee, Oklahoma, uh, saw a need for regulation of oil extraction in the Creek Nation. In 1906, a, the, the Creek Oil and Gas Company was created. Of course, we were faced with a period of uh, government termination uh, shortly after that, and, and it wasn't uh, long-lived. Needless to say, our, uh, our nation, our families, our heirs, our ancestors suffered then uh, from the taking of, of minerals at a less than fair market value. And hopefully in the future, we'll curtail that. We will, we will be in a position to protect the interest of the nation, of the heirs, and, and moving forward, hopefully uh, change at least how uh, the, the natural resources of eastern Oklahoma are handled and managed. Uh, the second initiative was the Natural Resource Conservation Commission. I've briefly touched on how important the land is. Uh, I think this commission will, will effectively uh, institute that concept uh, of protecting what lands we have left. Uh, it will require an, an extensive outreach from multiple uh, departments of the Interior Affairs uh, to, to get this, this uh, message effectively communicated. We are going to be doing these things. It has been done on a limited basis. I see it growing in the future. Um, again, with respect to the, the time allocated this morning for the audience to, to ask questions or the uh, uh, webcast uh, 
audience to send their questions in. I would uh, yield my time back to Ms. Giles. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, citizens, now it's your time for us to hear what your needs are. I want to remind everybody they can text their questions in. If you're watching via live stream, you can text your questions in to 918-706-8116. Again, 918-706-8116. Um, or you can send a message through facebook.com backslash MCNDCH. Again, that's MCNDCH. It's the Department of Community and Human Services Facebook page. So I'm going to get up. Um, if there's citizens in the audience that want to que ask questions, I'll bring the mic to you. So be thinking of your questions. Uh, meanwhile, those are in the audience. You have your surveys. Start thinking about um, getting those filled out at the end. We'll collect those and then do some door prizes. So, and then we will have some light lunch available for you before you leave. So just letting you know, we, we got some exciting things to wrap it all up, but we'll, it's time to get to the important thing of um, hearing your questions, concerns, and comments. Mado. Okay, is there anyone in the audience that has a question? Way up top, Mr. Yahola. I'm gonna get my exercise today. I need it. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, my question basically is also a, a comment regarding the nation, the status of the nation, as we are facing climate change and, and environmental <coughs> degradation, issues regarding water, food and uh, health in general. And, and so, and the issues of sovereignty. And as I hear, hear you all, and then I, I wasn't prepared for this, but as you're speaking, then things start to line up and the issues, first of all, has to do with, I, I will say it this way, food is medicine, food is a weapon. And, and so with that, I'm following that up by, by saying that we need to take control of our own food source and not depend on outside sources to provide food for us because we do not know who grew it, what kinds of toxins are in it, and cancer with our people has, we have to do something about that. We can do it as a nation. We are strong, we are powerful, We're, we can do this. And, and also, we look at maybe taking, taking agriculture since food is medicine, health and agricultural department may well work out to be one and the same. And we look at physical fitness. Agri-fitness is another way of looking at all of this. And, and so by look, taking care of our water source, our air, our land, the pollution that is out there, that our, our food will be healthy. And, and we can take our good food, our organic food, sell it, business, developing business. And, and so these are issues, they are, also, they are also questions too, but I'm just speaking in generalities. We have a big struggle ahead of us because the state of Oklahoma passed the law, HB 1471, in regards to agriculture, that we have no right, or municipalities, nations do have a right, to label food sources, and municipalities can't even come up with resolutions to, to do such things. But we have a right. So, all right, I, I know we have very limited time for them to listen, so, but we've listened, and I'm, okay. All right, so the question is, you know, what are you doing to address the sustainable economy, sustainable communities for the future generations? Mr. Five, Secretary Five. Thank you for the question, Mr. Yehola. The um, and, and certainly your words are, are heard here. Um, we we have been working for over a year with the United States Department of Agriculture, Oklahoma State University, and um, uh, more recently, um, Natural Resource Conservation on establishing a sustainable food source for the for the Muscogee Nation. 
um, through the strategic planning that uh, has occurred under this administration going back to, to about two and a half years ago, um, food has, has been a constant. It's been identified um, and the opportunities for us are in our control. Um, I think the, the important thing to, to understand is um, what you point out of, of the tribe's right to label its own food, it, 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 is, it, it does exist. Uh, through the USDA, the Animal Plant Health Inspection System, APHIS, um, we, are, we are working on uh, the details of the nation certifying its food source. Um, I would also add that, um, you know, to, to, to the nation's credit, we, we do use a limited number of uh, fertilizers, um, our beef production, uh, minimal antibodies that uh, we, there are certain ones that we must apply uh, due to the size of our, our herd and our crops, but we, we are cognizant of those things and um, we are addressing them. Thank you. Thank you. We do have two big long list of questions. Secretary Five. Yes, I would just like to make a comment as to regard to that question. We do have the components available in the tribe to address those issues. And I think that uh, it affects the uh, interior uh, realty services, agriculture, and the different programs that they operate, conservation. It affects the health systems. It affects the education. And it affects commerce because we do the business part of it. And the one thing that we are trying to do now is to work as a team to address these type of issues. And it hasn't been done before, but it can be done. It's a difficult task but I think that's, that's going to come about in the future that where the, tribe, the tribal administration will be working together and resolve a lot of these issues. I would, I would just like to respond briefly to uh, uh, part of your comments, um, particularly about um, food and then maybe the environment itself and everything. And, uh, you know, over the years, um, people have come to depend on the tribal government to take care of these things. Uh, but I think the other half of that formula is that individual citizens need to be responsible also to do their part. We talk about healthy foods and so on and so forth, but, but we practice eating fry bread. And it's probably one of the main starchiest foods that you can ever eat, and we, we've come to term it as traditional food. Uh, it probably isn't traditional food. It's a government uh, orient, oriented kind of source that we become accustomed to along with other uh, food process uh, uh, that we, we choose to eat. Uh, so I think uh, uh, citizens have a responsibility too. We're not going to break all of these sort of uh, decades-long dependencies that we've created overnight, and it's the tribal government in and of itself is not going to do that. But we can assist with a lot of health and wellness programs, which we do, um, And but citizens have to take that initiative to help out. It's going to be a, we're a, we're a, a huge uh, population of, of people uh, and it's just going to take all of us to do those things that you are mentioning. But they are very important. Uh, we, we can't lose our relationship with our land, as, as, as uh, Mr. Fife has pointed out. If we do, then we, uh, we no longer uh, you know, are a full, complete um, people, uh, and, and so on and so forth with food, too. So, uh, but I think we can assure that we do have the 
expertise to, uh, to do some of these things, but we do need the cooperation and the response of uh, the people themselves. Okay, we have a live caller <laughs> in a, a list of questions. So keep sending your questions in. We're writing them down as soon as we can get them text in or through the Facebook page. So we'll see if we can make this work using my limited use of technology. But, okay, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I am. I have a question for, uh, for Secretary of Interior uh, Phi. This is Marcella Giles. I don't know if we need to give our name for the record. And Secretary Phi, thank you for your good words. There is a redraft of 25 CFR 169, section 169, that allows the BIA to grant right of way without consent or consulting with the landowner. They also allow uh, the BIA to determine if the landowner is competent to remove the restrictions back to the era of termination. There is a petition that is up. It's www.gopetition. Uh, com, and we really need to urge all Alatis, all landowners, and every every Indian in the five civilized tribes to sign the petition to withdraw the draft regulations. I'm not, I guess my question is, has the nation been consulted uh, as a um, uh, part of sovereign uh, sovereignty, if, it's, if, if the nation has not been consulted, certainly the landowners have not been consulted. And the Indian Land Working Group, Secretary Fai, would, uh, would like to use a smart room, if we could, uh, to brief you on the work that has been going on, if that's possible. Okay, okay. we're going to have the Secretary respond now. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Giles. Uh, I, we, we at uh, Interior Affairs are very familiar with that section of the CFR, the proposed rules and regulations. Our comments have been prepared. Uh, we're to the point of, of submittal, uh, and we received notification that the uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, uh, Kevin Washburn, was going to extend the comments period. Um, we still do have our comments. We are adding additional language to the comments. Our position, we were, to, to back up, uh, we, we were not uh, consulted uh, with regards to the proposed amendments other than through the publishing of the CFR. Uh, we do monitor the CFR and um, look to see which, which proposed rules or regulations are going to affect the tribe. We would welcome the Indian Land Working Group to come to Okmulgee. Um, there, there is uh, a great benefit there, not only for the nation, but for the individual uh, landowners that we have today. Uh, hopefully, uh, I answered your, your question, Ms. Giles. I, I believe that we're uh, all that were asked. I Sh think Chief has a response. Yeah, uh, Sheriff, I may have an addendum to that. Uh, number one, if there is one individual that probably supports, I know in the past with uh, a group that uh, Ms. Giles was part of, which was oils, this is a very important aspect of uh, that whole argument is being able to continue that, uh, that relationship of uh, support for that organization. Uh, in addition to that, if there's one very popular thing that's around Indian country that we're finding out that it sometimes isn't always true is tribal consultation. In particular, we're subjects uh, and matters like this. Uh, once we find out we're aggressively seeking our 
input and the ability to actually ask, uh, in particular with uh, Assistant Secretary Washburn, on these types of matters. And I believe, and I believe that uh, Secretary Fife would attest to this, if there's one thing that we've done with this administration is strengthened the line of communication with Secretary uh, Washburn's office, and that we're able to go into that office and basically sit across the table from them and, and very uh, aggressively ask that tribal consult consultation is something that, that would be certainly uh, uh, coming to fruition on a lot of these things. So we're aggressively, when we're finding out things, uh, uh, seeking those tribal consultations. Thank you. Okay. Is there any questions in the audience? have two pages of questions already <laughs> that have been texted in or message, message in. Are there any language immersion programs available? Secretary Johnson? At the current time, uh, there, there really aren't any as far as uh, full immersion. Uh, I think there are a number of opportunities uh, throughout the nation where the language is taught uh, but perhaps uh, not in an immersion situation. Uh, those are, and efforts are being made to be able to create uh, immersion situations. It, it's difficult to, to say that, that there's a circumstance where only the language is spoken in any situation, whether it's in a school classroom or whether it's in a, a community, you know, classroom. Uh, but right now, probably the only classes that are available are just where the language is taught, but not perhaps in the immersion concept. Another text in um, question, are there any funds available for people that are otherwise financially sound when a need arises? Um, I guess I would answer that question. I think through our social services department, our tribe does have a hardship. Uh, grant available for our citizens. So again, if there's a break in income, an extenuating circumstance, um, outstanding medical bills, a loss of income, those sorts of things are available to citizens. We understand that. Um, we understand sometimes, and I, we just brought this up, we were just reviewing our policy. Some of our, we're in appointed or elected positions, so we won't always be in these positions, and then we, we find ourselves at a loss of income because we're not no longer working in that capacity. So those things are being addressed. But um, yes, normally financially stable people, you know, we understand things happen, things will come up unexpectedly. And so there are some assistance available in that area. I don't know if there's anyone else that would need to respond. Another question, has there been any thought towards a tribally run farmer's market? The concept of tribally run farmers market has been discussed. It, uh, we have gone as far as uh, seeking preliminary planning for the construction of a food market. I think um, with, with that concept, we, we roll in the now existing uh, conservation commission which has by law the authority to create co-ops between individual uh, tribal members and potentially extend outside of uh, the, the tribal market area. Thank you, we have a question from the audience. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> this is more an opportunity to put things into perspective. I think a lot of tribal citizens are misinformed or don't understand uh, the principles of sometimes how things are run in the government. When is something finally going to be done about Riverwalk? That is one of the most embarrassing things to our tribal citizens to make that big news, the big splash of purchasing this at such a great price. And I think a lot of people are misinformed about why Riverwalk is like it is. Could someone please address that? I could. I don't know if it's an embarrassment. I think it's a positive thing. Uh, number one, uh, we were we were so we were so uh, overjoyed on the ability to find a prime piece of property alongside the banks of the Arkansas River, directly across from the River Spirit Casino, that some of the infrastructure we didn't have in place. In addition to that, 
you know, we're wanting to pursue diversity in economic development. Uh, I believe we've done that. We're having to set uh, some parameters in terms of how to be able to address, number one, uh, tenants, uh, which is the most important thing. But uh, in particular, we're looking at something, and hopefully we can make an announcement sh uh, very shortly of, uh, of an exciting time for that period of, uh, uh, for that area, rather. Arkansas River is getting ready to explode in that area. Nowhere in the state of Oklahoma are you going to find the development that we currently see with the Margaritaville of the Muscogee Creek Nation. And just up the road, uh, up the river, I should say, uh, my friend George Kaiser has got a big development called The Gathering Place. You combine those two properties that are under development, that's almost a billion dollar development. There's no place in Oklahoma that has a development like that. Timing is a crucial. And we believe that right now is a good time to be able to develop what we have at Riverwalk. Now, I want to remind our citizens, that's almost a $50 million project that this nation got for $11.5 million. And nowhere can you find an ability to be able to purchase such a prime piece of property that's already developed for that price tag. We are meeting the uh, ability to pay back on the debt. Uh, if you remember, it was under uh, a different entity. I had approached the council on a couple of occasions to maybe change that particular process. It has been changed. Uh, we're now taking a very aggressive approach and finding anchor tenants uh, to be able to develop that, and we're very, very close to doing that. Again, it's about timing. With the development we have at the River Spirit location, is going to coincide with what we feel is going to be a, a major announcement soon. Uh, but uh, personally, I don't think it's an embarrassment. Thank you. All right. Tara's going to be walking around. If anyone has a question in the audience, please just raise your hand and she'll bring you the mic. Otherwise, I'll just keep reading the questions that have came in via text or message. Next question. Sorry. Does the tribe operate emergency housing for domestic abuse victims? Um, right now, the tribe does not have any emergency shelters of our own. We are actually in the process of creating a task force to address that issue. A couple years back, um, I was honored to actually support legislation that would take a percent of our liquor tax at the nation and put into a fund for a future shelter. Um, that it's gonna, it, Those shelters are a tremendous cost and operating. It's 24-7, so um, we're, we're going into that um, very heavily because we don't want to miss anything in that opportunity. But right now with our domestic abuse um, um, victims, we have been able to partner with the shelters throughout the Muscogee Creek Nation, um, providing services that way and have building a good rapport. So we, we've had lots of success. Um, we've not had anyone be able to be able to not be able to get into emergency shelter as needed. So we are addressing that issue. Another question, is it possible the tribe could assist individuals to become small farmers, co-ops, and lease or rent farm equipment? And I'll re look at Secretary Fide. Yes, there are, uh, there are going to be opportunities to do that uh, in our department, uh, to uh, do business plans for uh, small farm operations. And, uh, in the relation to a question that was asked earlier about uh, uh, farm to market uh, programs, we have been studying a regional food hub concept where uh, once we have individuals that have a uh, product, then we would like to uh, create a market so that the, uh, the regional food hub could purchase all of the products that are produced by our producers, and that would give them an outlet for, for their products, and we can use these uh, products in tribal operations, in the hospitals, the casinos, the schools, so forth and so on, and provide other markets in, uh, in the region. And also, the things that we couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, market internally in our area, we could uh, 
send to locate other markets outside, other food hubs outside of our, our market. So there are opportunities there. We're still in the process of studying that, but a lot of these things you can't do overnight. It takes time and uh, a lot of study and a lot of money. So these are the things that uh, are coming about. There are uh, uh, opportunities for uh, beginning farmers to uh, per borrow through the USDA. I think it's $35,000 in that program. Next question, does the tribe have a sports authority to encourage youth? I'd say not to, do we have, still have a sports commission? I think the rodeo has a rodeo club or a rodeo commission in, in Region 8, I think, are run here in, in our area. Uh, the Creek Festival has the, uh, the Summer Olympics. Uh, I'm not sure what else. Yeah, to our knowledge, um, to the person that asked the question, we do not have a, a direct support, a sports authority. Chief, is there anything else that... That we do have a sports commissioner. What I was going to say was that, that we have been meeting recently about, uh, in particular, the at-risk age group. We do really good uh, in terms of addressing programs for our youth, uh, for our elders, uh, for adults. However, there's a gap there of those at-risk age groups that we're not addressing. And we are currently seeking uh, about uh, how we can address uh, that age group. In particular, we're coming up with some kind of uh, recreational programs. Uh, that is something that's being looked at as, uh, as we speak. Okay, so expanding our current um, sports commission. Okay. Sarah? Next question, is the tribe looking at alternative power sources, solar, biofuels? We've been studying that area and uh, hopefully that uh, we, we're, we're looking at some uh, uh, strategic energy uh, plans that we can incorporate. We're also looking at uh, uh, creating a uh, intertribal uh, power authority whereby we can, all of the five tribes can get together and enter into this agreement to uh, become a a cooperative among the five tribes and purchase wholesale electricity and resell to our organizations within each tribe. So that's a very young thing that we're looking at, but it's a possibility. A question from the audience. Question is for Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, I appreciate the work that you do, and I'm very have a lot of pride in being a part of the Scholarship Foundation, which helps our students go off to college and do those kind of things. However, we have a lot of citizens that are very skilled with their hands, which are not necessarily college, but it's more trade school. Could you elaborate um, resources that are available to those type of individuals that are out there that looking for, as you mentioned earlier, about electricity and maybe heating and air and those kind of things? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for those words, Floyd, and I appreciate that question. Uh, obviously, when you, we look at the diversified opportunities that we have for our citizens in the education department, you know, we, we have the employment and training department, which is kind of a, a internship kind of training, perhaps leading to a full-time job. Uh, we also, uh, that employment and training area uh, provides uh, funding for tech schools. Uh, then on the other side of our building, as you know, we have the higher education uh, scholarship area where we provide funding for students who want to seek traditional baccalaureate programs, uh, also leading to master's degree and now doctoral programs. Um, and as you say, the, the middle of the road people you know, people that choose maybe not to go into the technical area or the traditional baccalaureate area. Uh, we're working with Dr. Colbert and a number of other people in our department, uh, Brad Fox in housing to, to look at developing an apprenticeship uh, program uh, where we provide opportunities for our citizens to become uh, plumbers, you know, electricians, 
you know, those, those programs where uh, they have strength in their skills, you know, not just common laborers, you know. Uh, and at, at the same time, you know, in the Tarot program, you know, we have the Job Bank where many of our citizens have an opportunity to uh, find work on a regular basis, perhaps being employed with some of the contractors and subcontractors who do work within our nation. Uh, you know, so we, we really feel like, you know, through all of our education programs, uh, we're developing uh, employment opportunities for, you know, for our citizens. But we're really excited about this new apprenticeship program uh, that we're developing. And we're kind of in the early stages of finding people who want to participate in that program. Okay, we have another audience question. This is a brief one. So this is for the housing because uh, I had been, I had looked at the National Resource website and uh, saw that the Muskog within the Muskogee boundaries there's an immense amount of clay. Clay deposits everywhere. And so when, when we go with what is given us, uh, the, the, the common method of, of constructions, I'm a builder too, and, but I do understand that, that we can, all we have to do is remember who we are as Muskogee people, and our people have always built, in the past, things with clay, adobe construction. And is there, are we limited or, are our, hand, our hands tied into looking at use, utilizing our, our own resources to build homes today? Thank you. We'll let Mr. Poole. We'll, we'll let Mr. Albert Poole answer that question from our housing department. Looking at different means, and one of them is the SIP panels. You know, we're not building with any natural resources, but uh, right now, one. Uh, forms we're building this is with the set panels. We have a plant down in Wetumpka, and that's what we're building out of right now. I don't know if I quite answered your question. Uh, no, not right now we don't. But it may be something we look to in the future. But right now we're not. Okay, thank you, Mr. Poole. Thank you. There's another audience question. Yes, I just have a question, another question for housing on the housing emergency management things. Uh, at my house, it flooded back in July, and um, I have a contractor supposed to be working on my house, and they were supposed to start last Wednesday, but they called and said they couldn't start because of the holiday weekend, and it is yesterday, they just started on the job. On Thursday, they started on the job, and they've only did just a few things, and they're supposed to be done with the job by next Thursday. And it consists of redoing piping and carpet and a lot of things, uh, redoing the walls and showers and things like that. Um, why is it that the contractor is only taking one day at a time on the job? because I'm having to pay for my bills at home and I'm not even there. Thank you. We're gonna have one of the other representatives from the housing department. And if, and if we're not able to answer the question today, we definitely can take your information and follow up with you, but I don't know if you wanna to try to respond. Yes. Tara. Uh, well, uh, first of all, man, what was your name? Jennifer Kelly. Jennifer Kelly. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Jerry Mays. I'm Construction Services, and um, this was. Well, I'm not. I'm not really. I, I don't know who the car, uh, who the contractor is at this point, but uh, you said he just started on it, and you've been out of your house for a while. I am aware of this that uh, that you had an emergency plumbing. Uh, and it flooded your house, and and uh, we have to go through certain. But I know it is emergency, but we have to go through certain procedures, you know, to get our our beds and stuff like that, the pre bid process. And like you said, it was a holiday weekend, and we can't really. 
I guess, um, force our contractors to be out there on the weekend and the holiday work. You know, I mean, they are they they are the contracts. You know, I mean, we don't. They're not from our. I guess what I'm trying to say are people like our force accounts. You know, that are on an emergency basis to go out on weekends and work out. Uh, but. Um, what we can do at this point is definitely, he kind of explained the process we go through, but definitely if we can get, if you can follow up with her, get her contact information and follow up with her so her individual uh, needs are addressed. So if you want to go ahead and meet with her yes, to get that information, then they can make sure to follow up individually with you. Okay. Okay. Do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, another text in question, has the tribe taken any lead in the eradication of mascots? And I, I know Chief Tiger has uh, made some comments and definitely. Like, let me. Yeah, we, we, as an individual, and this is something that hasn't been really brought to the council, but as an individual, I'm very much against the mascot issue. Uh, and I've gone on record to say that. I've gone public to say that. Uh, as a, just as an example, as a former sports broadcaster, Whenever I saw the team that I was covering playing someone that had a mascot of uh, Indians uh, or a logo of Indians, I never recognized that school's logo because I believe it's important that our elders taught us to, to always be respectful for who we are and where we come from. But as a nation, uh, I don't believe that we've really came uh, up with a, a stand uh, so to speak, but as an uh, individual, uh, 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 I believe that we have, uh, I have, uh, gone on record as being against the mascot issue. Uh, <clears throat> I'll uh, add some to that comment. Um, the recent um, interview with the uh, Interior Secretary, Sally Jewell, she indicated that uh, she hasn't taken a stand on this issue because she hasn't heard from tribal leaders. Well, she'll be hearing from uh, Principal Chief George Tiger here next week. <laughs> uh, I'm preparing a letter for her uh, and that he'll support because I know, I know his stance on this. And, uh, uh, you, know, you know, and throughout the years of diversity trainings that I've been a part of, uh, the one message that I always tried to say is mascots do not honor Indians. And, um, and, and people can make arguments uh, for that, that it does, but it, it, it doesn't. Um, and the broader you, you, you look at it, uh, it, it doesn't. So that's, that's our official stance on it, as Chief just said. Is there an audience question? Yes, there is. Hi, uh, my question is regarding the student loan program. I know the last listening sessions, uh, it was discussed, but it was never actually talked about. So that was a question I had is, does that program exist or is there a program that will exist in the future? And then another question that I have is regarding housing. I've also asked the same question prior, but it's uh, enlarging homes for growing families um, or uh, re adding rooms or upgrading their homes. Is there any program like that within the nation? We'll let Mr. Dr. Johnson try to address the first question. Uh, at, the, at the current time, the, the tribe has no programs that uh, provide for loans you know, for students. Uh, generally, I think the way we look at our programs is that we, we provide assistance. Um, but currently, we, uh, as a tribe, do not have uh, an ability to make a loan to a student for education purposes. And I don't know if anyone from housing is able to answer, respond to the housing question, enlarging homes, adding rooms, Natasha? Um, right now, um, when we house people, we house them based on the, the size of their family at that time. Um, we have come across some instances where the families have grown, and the only way that we were able to address those was, you know, if they had a garage, we could enclose the garage. Uh, but that expense is at um, the home buyers. Uh, I mean, we would do the work and then you would just pay it back to us. Um, but there are, right now, that's the only option that we have. Okay. 
Thank you. Next um, online question, is there going to be an increase of, increase of financial aid for higher education, not just the recent high school grads, but for the older non-traditional student in need of retraining to meet the changing job market? At the present time, uh, you know, we certainly have made a number of increases in the funding to uh, various levels of, of education. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly as we, we make changes, as you know, education is one of those areas where you make a change to try and adjust the funding upward to accommodate uh, the need. Uh, education continues to get more expensive. Uh, at this point, it, it'll be something that we'll continue uh, to look at. Uh, as I indicated earlier, I think one of the things that a number of our students uh, really don't do is they, they look at the tribe as a single source of funding, you know, rather than seeking funding on their own through, you know, a variety of scholarships. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, hopefully uh, when we get to our uh, establishing a career services department. We hope to be able to provide uh, assistance uh, for uh, helping our students uh, seek additional funding uh, to support their educational programs and their educational plans. Okay, another online question. What, pro what programs are available at the Tribal College for jobs in the gaming industry? I know we actually have one of our associate degree programs is in gaming. Not, I'd like to ask First Lady Frances Tiger as a former gaming instructor um, for our college if she's aware of any other, um, what else the college may be offering in regards to that. Well, I know that they have a degree planned out there that's uh, specifically for uh, the gaming instruction. I know that uh, a lot of the um, professors are um, employees of the gaming facility in Tulsa. Um, so I would just suggest that uh, the, the person that called in just call uh, the College of the Muscogee Creek Nation and they would be able to um, assist with that question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know at one time, I just, I'm sorry to call you out like that, um, Francis, but definitely I know she at one time she was actually even traveling up to one of our Northeast a different tribe to actually offer some of our um, College of Muscogee Nations gaming courses. So I just think that's a unique um, opportunity that our tribe offers to other tribes as well. So next question on the list, is there any cooperation with gaming companies to educate our people for jobs at casinos? We don't, I don't know if Buddy can, um, the question was, are there, is there any cooperation with gaming companies to educate our people for jobs at casinos? Well, actually, there's not, not with gaming companies. One of the things we have been doing is um, we've been in touch with the college and we're starting some conversation on gearing the uh, college courses at the Muscogee Nation College more to specific jobs in the casino itself rather than a general uh, associate degree in gaming you would actually take courses that would help you prepare for a specific job at one of our casinos. Uh, so, you know, that, that's one of the things that we're working on now. Okay, if there's no other question, I'll keep going down the list. With the current price of beef, has the tribe looked at ranch management? I think we've kind of answered that. But um, so hopefully that person was listening, because I think some of these questions were coming in before some of the secretaries got to speak. Um, is it possible that the tribe could enter into contracts with individuals targeted at specific needs within the tribe as far as specific degrees? So I think it's possible. I think we've kind of done that, especially in health. I think we um, definitely we, we see the health care needs. And I don't know, Seneca, if you want to kind of address what you've done in your marketing campaign to recruit doctors and providers back to the nation. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for the, uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, just like uh, Ms. Giles indicated, you know, as we, uh, our goal is to uh, reduce the amount of services that we send out our system. And so what we're trying to do is we have to bring those services in, those expertise in our system. So we've been actively 
trying to recruit and seek those individuals that have that type of degree that, that we're seeking, uh, where we're sending uh, out through the newspaper or, or Facebook, items like that. But we have uh, specifically targeted, uh, specifically our Creek citizens and our native, um, our native uh, people that have that type of degree. So we're, we're going and uh, relying on our resources that we have specifically with our providers. Uh, we have increased tr dramatically in regards to the uh, Creek, not just native providers, but our Creek providers wanting to come home. Um, that's through uh, better working conditions, uh, better salaries, uh, better benefits, uh, and resources that we weren't able to provide before. So we have uh, increased our resources, our salaries, and so on, and that's how we have in Department of Health have sought out those needed individuals that we need in our system that can help us uh, progress and take and provide better quality care for our patients. And I would like to add, and it's not my area, but because <laughs> I'm married to someone in a different area, I know they have, um, uh, my husband oversees the Cultural Center and Archives Department here, and they, if you want to call it a contract or consult it with the University of Tulsa, because there's some specialized areas that we don't have here at the nation. Meanwhile, it's, it's a working partnership that way you can learn from them, because that's the intent. We may not have that direct skill set we need, and, but yet we, we can partner with someone else to help us do that and learn it as we're going through that. So I think the nation, we do do that in different areas. So it may not be a long term and they may not necessarily be nation employees, but they're working with us so that we can help um, get those added skill sets that we need here. So I think it happens at different levels for sure. Okay. No other, is there another audience question? <coughs> Um, yes, I just have a question. I don't know if anybody's here from personnel that can answer this, but um, I had a, about three months ago, I had put an application in for a receptionist position with uh, employment training with Courtney. And um, I had called, checked on my application with personnel, and uh, they kept saying that I wasn't put on the list for an interview. And um, I had went in about a month ago and to try to get employment assistance with uh, Courtney and them through their employment and training programs to see if they can help me find a job. And Courtney asked me, how come I never came in for an interview? And um, I went to personnel and asked them, how come I wasn't called for the interview? It, and excuse me, they said that they called me. And I did receive a phone call a di one day from personnel. And I called the personnel back and asked them, all day long, everybody in the office, Lucille, Tiger, Greg, everybody that works in there, Sandra, if anybody had called me for an interview, and they kept saying no, nobody called for an interview. And then when I ran into Courtney, she asked me how come I never showed up to this interview. And I would just like to know, who are we supposed to ask about when we call in for our interviews? Because um, when now, with the new application process, you have to put an application in for every new job. And I put an application in. Okay. And whenever I call to check on the job, the personnel is telling me to call the managers at those job sites. When I call the managers, they're telling me to call personnel. Personnel okay. is telling we, us. We have our, and I'll let um, Chief speak, and yeah. definitely we can address this. Number one, we, we are very appreciative of the questions that are asked. There's been two occasions when there's been personal issues that I think could be addressed, not in this forum, but in particular, if you want to, after we get through here, Dr. Hughes, who's the director of our human resources, you can approach him and he could probably answer that question. We're basically interested in program, uh, program questions, but on personal things, if we don't know the answer, we're going to encourage you to uh, visit with, there's been a couple of questions you've had, in this case with Dr. Dr. Hughes, and then I think with uh, uh, Mr. Poole or, or Mr. Uh, hey, uh, Hayes afterwards. So uh, anyway, we appreciate your questions. So after, if you'd like, you can ask Dr. Hughes. He's in charge of that program. Okay. All Thank right. you. Maru, Jimio. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. um, Dr. Hughes, I don't know. Do you want to touch in our application process? Because there may be citizens out there at least that want to know how to apply if they're looking for a job at Creek Nation. If you can just broadly uh, kind of explain that, what the yeah. process is. 
Yes, I'll be glad to. Uh, we do have an online application process. Uh, we do require that an individual submit an application for each position they're applying for. It's a little bit of a change, but it's a clear way to know where that application should route to what department. Uh, we're still finding some glitches and some things that we're working out uh, with the system, but we'll be glad to sit down with any individual. All they'll need to do is call me, and we'll be glad to sit down and find out what happened or where that glitch may have been or why their application wasn't processed or didn't get to the right department. Uh, but uh, so the, the young lady that asked the question, I'd be glad to sit uh, later and visit with her as well whenever. But uh, our door's always open and we'll answer the phone and answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Um, next question on the list, are there tribal funeral homes? No, we do not have any um, tribal funeral homes. It has been um, discussed numerous times and um, we're still in the process evaluating those. I know there's a lot of number of council members that are in, in, looking at that. From a social services perspective with the tribal burial, um, the BIA burial that we um, administer, we have had increase in the tribal thanks to the council and the administration for looking at that additional increase to cover that need. Um, at the same time, we are working on contracts with local funeral homes so that there are, we found a lot of funeral homes taking advantages of our citizens, especially at such a sad, critical time. Um, so we're trying to get it streamlined a little bit better for our citizens so that they're not, you're not purchasing things that aren't necessarily needed and are above and beyond what the tribal burial or BIA burial will, will pay for or cover. Um, so we, we are addressing that in, in, in the most cost effectiveness, effectiveness of the need. And I don't know, Chief, did you have, um, I can't remember if it was you or Speaker, I know Comanche Nation has a funeral home, so there's been some discussions. It's been um, definitely something that's being researched. There has been numerous occasions, uh, uh, I believe even going back as far as when Chief Fife was, uh, was a chief, that uh, this uh, topic has always came up. And that uh, process of really doing some research and things continues. Uh, we're finding out that the Comanche Nation having their own funeral home has certainly been an advantage. Um, of course, uh, realizing that Comanche Nation doesn't have the enrollment that we do. So there's some uh, parameters, if you will, that has to be considered, but we are looking at uh, continuing our, our effort to, uh, to address that. Question, how is the tribe responding to the needs of returning servicemen and women in the light of serious rates of post-traumatic disorder that is being seen? Um, and I'm refer to Seneca from our Department of Health. Uh, thank you for uh, that question. Uh, you know, with the uh, service women and men that are returning, I know a lot of them uh, either go to the uh, VA or go to our, um, our VA department that we, that we have here. And the process that that we have here for the PS, uh, PTSD is it's a referral process. As you come into the private, uh, our primary care, then we refer you uh, to our, our behavior health. And as the needs within um, the Muscogee Creek Nation and, and Indian country uh, where we're, we're facing and we're entering this every day, it's a need that across Indian country that everyone's trying to address have we as we have native people have an increased amount of uh, citizens that are uh, men or women that have came back from uh, a conflict such as that we've had occurring and so as what we're doing here is we're we're expanding our employees we're expanding our therapists uh, the normal steps that usually occur when you go through that process is uh, you go through you go through a referral and what they're usually going to do is uh, therapy, individual therapy, uh, family therapy, or, or, or medication. That's normally what we do here. But as we've seen an increased need, we're needing to increase our, our services here, increase our staff. And but what we are doing along with uh, behavioral health, long-term care, and dental will be one of our main focus uh, this next coming year. And so we are developing an all, most of our energy towards uh, that area. And um, you know, we rely on uh, the VA and um, to help us with those individuals that, that seek out that service. Uh, but if you have someone or if you know of someone that, that, you know, the difference between PTSD and a normal trauma, you know, PTSD is something that's a little bit more long lasting um, than a normal trauma. And so that's why it's very important 
uh, that they uh, seek uh, assistance uh, immediately. And then we'll, we'll do our best on our end is to provide and put more resources towards that end. And, but we are expanding. We've made a lot of changes in, in regards to our behavior health. We've had some new leadership, uh, kind of letting her feet get wet a little bit as we expand and uh, expand that program and start offering uh, more services and expand. Thank you. And of course, the nation does offer our um, Veterans Affairs Service Officer Directors, Mr. Ken Davis. Um, so I, I think there's been a lot of partnership between our Veterans Office here and the Department of Health. Um, there's a couple of questions, and I think we kind of answered them, but just want to make sure we did. Um, business development opportunities outside of Oklahoma. And I don't know if they mean as a nation or for individual citizens. Well, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, maybe John may have an idea on that, but uh, we've had outside companies come into uh, our office and want to do business with the tribe. Most of these companies come in and they want the tribe to take all the risk and they want to manage everything and, and then the tribe gets very little out of it. So uh, we haven't done anything in that area, but uh, there's always that possibility that we can do businesses, we can do business either tribal business developed outside of our jurisdictional boundaries or partner with a company that wants to, is truly interested in doing business with the tribe. And I think there's a lot of benefit for companies to come in and do business with the tribe more, than, more so than just uh, what they can get from, from the tribe to do business. And if they're truly interested in do, doing business with the tribe, they will invest as much as the tribe so that both can be successful. And there was, while you're talking, there's two more questions that were kind of related to doing business. What is the, what support is there for someone wanting to establish a new business or purchase an existing business? And that's, I think, back through your offices and. Yes, the, uh, our business development center can, can certainly help with that. We've had individuals and we're actually working with individuals today uh, to purchase a pretty good sized business. And uh, uh, through our small business center, we are uh, working with them and developing a, a, a good business plan, working with the banks to uh, make sure that their finances are gonna be met and different things such as that. So that's a possibility. They just need to contact our office and we can uh, set them up with an interview and begin there. Okay, and there was another question. I just wanna make sure everyone has their questions responded to. And I, again, I think it came in before you actually got to speak and was about, um, are there plans for a small business incubator, which we had, you said yes. Yes, we, we do uh, have plans. If we get funded f for this Rural Business Opportunity Grant, uh, then we will be setting up a, a business incubator. And we've been looking at different types of incubators that uh, we can uh, actually uh, manage, and that's maybe even in the agriculture uh, sector, where we can get individuals started in uh, producing products, maybe greenhouses, and as uh, Mr. Yehola said, uh, there are opportunities to uh, do other things, aquaculture, you know. And I'm just excited to hear you talk, because even as a cabinet member, and sometimes we don't know what's all happening, because so much is happening so much, and to realize all these things have happened in less than three years, we made tremendous strides, and we're, you know, looking at all these other things, too, so I'm always still excited to hear what's happening. Um, and I don't know if you would know, because one of the questions specific, how many new businesses have been started by the tribe? Well, we've actually made... 11 or 12 loans so far, so I guess these are new businesses that have been started uh, with individual entrepreneurs. Now, as far as the tribe, you know, the uh, One Fire Holding Company is in business now. They're very young. They're still working out much of their administrative uh, capabilities, and uh, as I understand, they've done some business, so I guess it's a start. Uh, you know, being in business for only 
less than a year, it's, uh, it's really difficult to jump in and, and start doing business so quickly. Uh, we are looking at several businesses that uh, can uh, be uh, either operated through one fire or through a tribal uh, enterprise, and uh, you know these things will come about as time passes. Chief? Yes, uh, I think uh, when we talk about economic development, we have tendency to forget that even in health, with the new medical center and with the rehabil rehabilitation center, they are health-related uh, entities, but they're also economic development. Uh, and I believe those are things that we forget sometimes are new businesses, uh, in, in particular in the last, uh, uh, less than two years now. Great. Okay, we have an audience question? Yes, we do. Hi, my question is, where and what do you see in communities within the next 10 years regarding constitution changes and issues occurring and recurring? Well, number one, community certainly is a priority for this administration. As I've said many times, that uh, uh, the backbone and the background uh, uh, of our historic uh, uh, being as a nation is, is the communities. Uh, but I think the best way to answer your question is it's up to the communities themselves. They are responsible for your, the ability to change your constitution and bylaws as they see it. Uh, you know, there is a process in place within their own communities as to how to address those issues. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty well known that this administration is not gonna be dictating to those communities. We will be providing technical assistance in terms of how we can help you to address some of these issues, but we're not gonna come in and make any recommendations. That's in the past. Uh, and maybe Cher wants to, uh, to add on to, to, to my comment. Definitely, just really uh, reiterate what Chief has said. Um, it, it's your destiny, it's your community. The nation doesn't wanna interfere on what you guys wanna do at your community, because we don't know what's best for you, because we're not members of those communities. So just like this nation, this nation is what we make it, and your communities are what you wanna make it. So if you, if you wanna change it, you have a, a, poli a process to do that. People wants to change the constitution of this nation. There's a process to do that. So it, I mean, the people really do have the power at every level of government. So it's just important to remember that it, it is about the people. And if you guys are strongly feel one way or another about something, then bring it to the attention of the community of the government. Um, I think it's your best use of your own sovereignty at your community center. So um, our job again is just to help you through that process, provide the technical assistance. To you know, we try to go through scenarios with you so you can see well if this happens this this can happen um and so forth but ultimately it'll be back to the community their decisions for their their future okay. thank you yeah. um what online question what are the thoughts of synergizing with other tribes on services what are the thoughts of synergizing with other tribes on services Go ahead. <laughs> Nobody else is pulling up to the table. Uh, number one, I think if there's one thing uh, in the last three years uh, that we've seen, in particular with the five civilized tribes, is the reorganization uh, of the Intertribal Council with the emphasis in helping each other. And uh, I know that we're doing that uh, in all aspects of uh, what we do as tribal governments uh, with uh, even some economic development uh, ventures that uh, are on the horizon. Uh, just a quick oversight of uh, what we do at the Intertribal Council is that we do have various committees uh, at the Intertribal uh, Council uh, meetings that meet to discuss how we can help each other. Uh, I know that uh, one of the things that is really uh, a good committee in terms of sharing a lot of ideas and maybe uh, helping each other is uh, uh, in particular in health area, um, and something maybe that Seneca would like to comment on. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as within <coughs> sharing services, uh, sharing services, uh, as we move with, meet with tribes across the country, across Oklahoma, and particularly in the Intertribal uh, Council, um, you know, it's not just services, but also best practices. You know, we take a lot of best practices and share a lot of best practices to where we can better take care uh, of our patients. But, you know, as we have expanded, we, 
you know, our diagnostics area, our CT, MRI, we have a nuclear medicine, um, and then now we're collaborating with uh, Chickasaw Nation and some of the services that they have, and so that we can keep, because we have a lot of our patients that live south of here that utilize Chickasaw Nation that we were referring out to outside our jurisdiction. So we're able to uh, work with those guys and keep our patients, not just within uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation, but within our native facilities. Uh, we have eight facilities. Chickasaws have eight. Choctaw Nation has eight. Cherokees have eight. So we're able to work together and as if we've expanded our services because we share the same patients. I know we're constantly meeting. We had a meeting yesterday with a, a tribe in regards to how we can work together in regards to uh, our long-term care. Uh, we're doing something in long-term care. They're doing something different. And we want to work together and see how we basically have the market on the eastern part of the state, and they're going to develop a market on the western part. And so how can we work together to keep that funneling from each other? And so that is something that we are doing on a daily basis uh, to uh, con continuity of care, accessibility, and to reduce cost. And so it's important that we uh, strive to do that in the future uh, just to provide great quality care. Is there an audience question? Yes, there is. Good afternoon. Uh, this is about realty, I guess. Um, when you put a tribal home on the allotment land, uh, that acre is taken away. Um, is there any process or is there any way that uh, the family can get that acre back put into the allotment uh, afterwards? Thank you for that question and good afternoon. The um, process will not allow for the land to go back into restricted status, the one acre. So what we would need to do is fill out an application to place that one acre into USA Trust. Uh, once the restrictions, that's, that's the importance of the 47 Act uh, and how it affects the future of this nation. When that blood quantum uh, reaches half degree or less, the restrictions are lifted. Historically, from 1978 to uh, more recently, the uh, early 2000s, the, the requirement through housing and uh, the Bureau was to, to remove that one acre for purposes of constructing a home. What we've done now is created a, a long-term lease. Uh, it would run contiguous with the uh, emer emeritization of the housing unit itself, uh, probably 25 years, I think. Um, so that, that question is, is it's really a sharp question because historically the one acre that was removed from that allotted uh, land, the home may not even have been constructed on that one acre for various reasons. And what you had in a lot of cases were homes being constructed on restricted land. Uh, the, the issue has historically been brought uh, since the early 90s of why we must remove that one acre to construct a home. I think we're making progress in, in eliminating that through the long-term lease and to directly answer the question. It, it can never go back to restricted status. It must go to trust status. Um, Jeff, could I add something to that? Um, sure. The Veterans Administration, through their programs, they do have a program for Native American veterans who, who live on restricted land to be able to put a house and a home and uh, not lose that restricted status. So I think we might take a look at that. Uh, if they can do it, then I don't see why a sovereign tribe can't do the exact thing. So I think that's something we could probably look at. Thank you. Okay, for housing, is there help available for home purchase outside of tribal boundaries? Madonna? Yes, that would be with the mortgage down payment and closing cost program. It's not, it doesn't, it's all in the state of Oklahoma. It doesn't stay, that's the only program that doesn't stay within the boundaries. Okay, so only, but it still has to be within the state of Oklahoma. Yes. Okay, but doesn't necessarily have to be in Muscogee Creek Nation boundaries. No. Okay. 
All right, that's all through my questions. Was there any more, anything else come in online or any more audience questions? Well, how exciting. I was very excited we had this many questions come in online, so it means people are watching. We may have a limited audience here, but definitely thank you guys for coming out in the pouring rain. So at this time, if we can get our surveys out, and we'll have Tara and Jennifer collect those surveys, and we'll give you a ticket. Um, Tara, if you want to come grab the tickets, they're down here in this green basket. Jennifer, if you can help her do that. I want to thank uh, my staff. Tara and Jennifer are just two, Sean and Barbara and Misky and Tina and the others that came out just at the last minute. We always think we can do everything by ourselves. So we just like say, hey, by the way, we need some help. Um, so they came out early this morning in the rain and got set up. And um, so we do have some food still available. Um, once you leave here, please grab a, a, a little a wrap and some chips and take them home with you. And we'll get these surveys collected and give out some door prizes. Chief? Yes, just closing comments. Again, I want to personally thank everyone that uh, uh, had their input in this listening session. These are very important sessions. They've been all successful everywhere that we've gone. Again, it's our fourth and final one for this calendar year. Uh, the one thing I want to stress is we have made tremendous uh, advancements in our programs and some of the things that we do at the Muscogee Creek Nation. However, we also want to say this, some of the issues and concerns that you've shared with us will not go unnoticed. I mean, we will address those. You know, at the Muscogee Creek Nation, just as with any governmental entity, we're not perfect by all means. But we always say we're going to strive for perfection. And I believe that's what we do as, as administration, as workers, and uh, as, uh, uh, as elected officials. So we thank you for your comments. We thank you for your questions. Because that gives us, and again, earlier I used a phrase, blueprint. It allows for us to have a blueprint to address those issues and concerns for the future. So again, I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank our citizens that were watching over webcasts and for their input. Uh, because it was a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity today to hear from uh, some of our citizens that may not live within our jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Thank you. And for those citizens that still may be watching, I know they're missing out on some of the food and the door prizes we're doing, so next time we'll rethink this and figure out a way to include them in that as well. So just keep that in mind that we, def we definitely don't want to disclude anyone. We want to make sure everyone throughout the United States and abroad, we know citizens, we have citizens everywhere, and that's, that's the power of the internet, and that's the power of the Muscogee Creek Nation. So we'll give out some door prizes here. I want to thank some of our programs and um, some of our businesses that donated to our door prizes, and I um, appreciate, again, everyone for coming out and all the cabinet secretaries. Oh, Sherry, sure, we have a comment. Oh, okay. As a citizen, I would like to thank you for giving up four of your Saturdays to inform the citizens of what your departments do and how they function. I have been to all four, and I have learned very much from each one. So thank you again, Mado. Well, Sue and uh, Georgia, we definitely appreciate you. I said, um, are, you, uh, are you our groupies for listening sessions? But I mean, they, 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 that's what we, we need. We need citizens that want to be informed because I know then they're great spokespeople for the nation. They can go back and tell their communities. And fortunately for us at Muscogee Creek Nation, when people Google us, their community center usually pops up. So they get a lot of calls that the nation should be getting. But because they keep themselves informed, they're able to answer a lot of questions for us. So on behalf of the nation, we thank you for doing that. And again, the power of our communities that we allow you to, allows you to be out there and answer, help answer those questions for us and being um, good um, stewards and citizens of this nation, too. So, All right, ladies, are you ready? Okay. So we're going to grab some tickets. And if we can grab one in the bags, first ticket, 207-7714.